The Ramon Margolef Award for Excellence in Education is given to scientists and educators for excellence in teaching and mentorship in the fields of limnology and oceanography. Dr. Russell Kuhl receives the 2021 Ramon Margolef Award in recognition of his outstanding 27 year leadership in training, mentoring, and providing professional development opportunities that have promoted a diverse undergraduate presence within the aquatic sciences. Dr. Russell Kuhl is a senior scientist at the School of Freshwater Sciences at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. Dr. Kuhl has made teaching and mentorship a prime focus throughout his distinguished career in science. All nomination letters note the impressive and long-term dedication that Russell has given to a research experience or RU program. Over the course of 27 remarkable years, Dr. Kuhl developed and ran an aquatic science REU at UW-Milwaukee, which provided exposure to aquatic systems at the ocean scale and accumulating up to nearly 60 student ship days in that process. I was one of those participants. Uh, notably, Dr. Kuhl designed the program to be interdisciplinary from the beginning, ensuring that students experience the true breadth and possibilities of aquatic science. In addition to developing and maintaining a successful RU program, Dr. Kuhl was pivotal to the formulation of the RU meetings program. Since 1999, hundreds of undergraduate students have taken advantage of this unique program that sends RU students to a scientific conference to present their research, participate in professional development opportunities, and network with scientists. The reach has extended to school teachers through concurrent consortium of ocean science exploration and engagement and geo ed expeditionary programs. Dr. Kuhl's passion for aquatic science has engaged thousands more through K through gray programming in local middle schools and community colleges and on national and international television research engagements. Most recently, Kuhl has been instrumental in the formulation of an internship program called Water Cis STEM, See Yourself Succeeding in STEM, training students from community and technical colleges for the water science technical force. Many of Dr. Kuhl's colleagues and former students have noted the considerable impacts that his thoughtful mentorship and teaching style have had on their own approach to teaching and mentoring. For example, one nominator notes that they have never encountered another scientist so passionate about experiential education and mentorship. Russell's interrogating questions during their own experiences helped them think on their feet and ensured that they knew not only what they were doing, but also why and how it fit into the larger picture. They go on to note that now, as a professor at a teaching-focused institution, they often emulate aspects of this approach when working with their own students. As they say, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Please join me in congratulating and welcoming our 2021 Ramon Margolef Awardee for Excellence in Education, Dr. Russell Kuhl. Well, thank you very much, Amina, for that introduction that recognizes uh, one of the main things that I really have enjoyed about uh, interacting and doing aquatic science. Aquatic science is something that is quite popular with people. You walk into a bar and you go, hi, I'm Dr. Cool and I'm a marine biologist. And I tell you, everybody smiles. If you said I'm a lawyer, it might be different. But marine biology or aquatic sciences in general is something which attracts the public's attention and is something that can be made interesting uh, to everyone. On the screen right now, uh, I have a variety of things that many of us do, seminars, workshops, field trips, uh, middle school, high school, college, all kinds of different things that we do to reach many targets. And I do this too. And I, I want to say right now that, that Carmen Aguilar has been a critical component of our collective work. And I want to appreciate that our collective work has actually led to my nomination as a principal instigator uh, for this award because uh, I feel very strongly that there is a need to integrate uh, science and education. And so 
we have worked hard in what we call research education. Interdisciplinary hypothesis testing, hands-on, expeditionary, collaborative research experience. That's always a goal. Many of us have that goal. It sometimes is logistically difficult to achieve it. So here in this, in this presentation, my first award ever in my life, uh, I'm going to give a couple of slides about my history, and then I'm going to show you how over the years we have used our resources to develop a collaborative interaction among students from many levels working on an aquatic science resource. First, I went to Antarctica as a uh, work study student in the food chain research group at Scripps during JDH Strickland's last cognizant year. Many of you have used Strickland and Parsons as a methods manual, and I knew him, and I worked with his group. And I went to Antarctica twice with them and several other really exciting things. And they handed me off to the late Dr. Holger Janisch at Woods Hall, with whom I did my graduate work. And at that time, I attained five Alvin dives to 3,700 meters, in addition to a variety of other research cruises uh, on the big ocean. And I love big weather. And so that's my fave. I've had thousands of days at sea. And this graph, this uh, map shows a little bit about what, where places that I have done research. I have worked on a research vessel in every ocean except the Arctic, and I have done scientific work on every continent. And so when I came to uh, Lake Michigan, I discovered that instead of going all over the place, I could go to the same place all over time, and I could develop an understanding of time series and how large water systems work over time. And so in the upper left-hand corner, you see a map of our neighborhood and typical cruise tracks that we take, our time series station called Fox there in the middle on the left, and then the outside Sheboygan Reef Station right on the line between Michigan and Wisconsin about 90 kilometers offshore. Below that is our research vessel, the Niske, a 71-foot Korean T-boat, and it is capable of working with six to 10 people in the scientific group. We had six during the COVID closure for eight cruises. On the right, you'll see uh, four panels that show 20-year time series of silicate and temperature and chlorophyll and a variety of things uh, at that station. And many of those points are created by the students we're gonna talk about. What I wanna do is I wanna go through here and talk about different disciplinary concepts and link them together into a single unit where students work together, collaborate and produce something that is way beyond anything that any one of us could do. So first, everyone talks about temperature. Temperature is in freshwater. Temperature is the major controller of density and stability. In marine systems, salinity is big and complicating, but in freshwater, it's pretty easy. So on the left, you see a satellite and a buoy, and you see students from our water system, see yourself succeeding in STEM, a technical college program. On the right, you see a bucket and a CTD, a conductivity temperature depth electronic instrument. And that's the one that the young man at the bottom there, Tim T, a physics major that came into our RU program, locked onto, and he was using it to collect information about the physics of the water column, as you see on the right, some tiny graphs, but I'm going to show you a little bit more. However, his work in physics is really the basis of a lot of stuff. So we're gonna put him uh, on the uh, upper left-hand corner of this developing graph graphic here. Now he got so interested that when he went back to school, he added math as a second major 
And then he came back and worked with us for the summer between graduate school and graduating. And we took him out on cruises and he ran the CTD in that circled area, the oval uh, on the right were 15 CTD stations across something that I call a seamount in Lake Michigan. And up in the upper left-hand corner is a flow diagram, a flow model that we use in the public and in science to show about stratification. But in the middle, what you see is a north-south transect across the seamount with a clear seamount-like uh, uh, change in the distribution of temperature and chlorophyll. You see doming at the front, you see a upwelling at the front, you see a compression of the thermocline, you see a deeper thermocline on the backside, and you see chlorophyll fluorescence increase at the leading edge and decrease downstream. Now that downstream part is unusual, but we'll put his hydrodynamic stuff also in that little box area there. When we send the CTD down, uh, we get more than just temperature, we get fluorescence and transmission. In this figure, you see one, two, three, four peaks of chlorophyll, the green color, that are opposed by decreases in transmission on the right by the transmissometer, an independent measure. So we can put biophysical structure up here on our, uh, our chart that we're developing. And the biophysical structure includes things like optics. Optics is uh, measuring light, various light. Uh, satellite people are dying to get ground truth for their optical measurements. Here we see Megan, uh, a high school student with us, a UWM student, a surf student, that's an undergraduate fellowship. She went to graduates, she went, did work with, uh, uh, at, did her undergraduate finish at University of Rhode Island, came back here for a summer job. Now she works for the EPA. Uh, and below her is a UBM, that's a, um, undergraduate biomath program, computer science major and biology major, Yang and Sarah, and then Michelle, not, not seen, is lowering a light meter for visible light. So what we find is that with the invasion of quagga mussels uh, in the middle graph uh, on the side, uh, that there's been a huge change in water clarity over the 20 years. And at the bottom, if you go from the right to the left, you go from offshore to middle to near shore, you see that the turbidity created by phytoplankton increases as we move inshore and even causes an anomalous biphasic light curve. So we're gonna put optics in there also. And then we're going to say, well, because we saw that stuff, we need to sample it and find out what it is. And so we went out there and our students took Niskin bottles and collected water samples and Jennifer from SUNY uh, ESF and Ian E from uh, the RU program from Co College where my uh, grandparents immigrated from Bohemia uh, into Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They did this stuff. Here's uh, two Ashleys, different Ashleys working on the vessel, leaf collecting some water, I mean some light measurements and Tim and our UBM math professor, Istvan, working. And here we have, Jesus, you're not supposed to do that. Uh, here we have uh, the uh, uh, Yvette looking at the distribution of pigments in the water column. You can see the deep chlorophyll maximum right in the middle. And she did nutrient assessment studies in which instead of adding a bunch of, of nitrate or a bunch of ammonia or phosphate, she added just a little bit like muscle pea, a little bit each day. And what we found was that the cumulative amount shown in the middle uh, is never seen. And in fact, the, the phytoplankton are able to take up everything and never detect it. So we're gonna put uh, the phytoplankton ecology there. And we'll also put the nutrient dynamics because that's an important part. Another thing that we do together is animal population biology. Uh, RU program Dylan uh, is here shown uh, rinsing down a net for zooplankton. And he also, along with many other students, 
was very good at collecting with a ponar, and you see the invasive quagga mussels. Now here, invasives are something that really make things run for the public. And so along with National Geographic and Bob Ballard's Jason program, we developed a curriculum called Resilient Planet, which had some cutesy artwork like the alien invasion stopped at sea. And we also made a game called Ego Defenders that students played in the classroom. So we're off the boat into the classroom. And speaking of classrooms, look, here's a bunch of teachers out on our boat. They're collecting water samples. They're using the plankton net. They're grabbing at the bottom. And then they're walking into the lab with us and they're using every instrument that we have to make all kinds of measurements about invasive species and link them to the resilient planet uh, curriculum. So we'll add the animal population biology, but just counting them isn't enough. We have to know what they are. So Kelsey uh, prepares samples for her biochemical work and she measures them and she writes everything down. And part of her work, a very small part is shown in the upper right hand corner, which is a uh, chemical characterization of muscle body tissue. And then everyone worked on size frequency distributions, which gave meat to uh, undergraduate biomath major uh, Dylan, who created a, uh, an understanding of how many walleye pike there would have been if quagga mussels hadn't eaten all the phytoplankton. Then in the upper left hand corner, a uh, Latino MS student, Joe, measured the muscle P, and many people have done this also, looking at the uh, elemental excretion. And so we'll put that on there. And then we, we can't do it all the time, so we have to model it. So here, UBM student Leith created a model for looking at the growth rate and the cohort analysis of the muscles. So she's there. And then the muscles eventually die and our Native American student at Ojibwe, uh, Elizabeth Redwing, shown on the left, she measured the size frequency distribution of muscles and found that when the dead muscle shells started to appear, that they were all really big. And that allowed us to assess the lifespan of the muscles in the offshore. Those shells went to uh, Ashley D. Uh, who was a geochemist and she extracted them for atomic absorption spectroscopy, which you see in the bottom graph that samples that were warm had very low calcium magnesium ratios and samples that were always cold had high. And so we could kind of assess the lifetime behavior of them. Here also in the pure biogeochemistry of muscles, we find that the uh, Ellen is uh, looking at the decay of muscle tissue in muds and the release of nutrients. And on the right, high school student uh, Clarice with an S who came in on the bus three times a week to use our Holland Aller Teflon CO2 system, uh, measured the uh, dis dissolution rate of shells, assessed that they lasted a long time and won a full ride to the University of Southern California. So we put them there. And now all these students and people have worked hard together. You've seen how they interacted in terms of everybody collected, everybody shared, and then everybody went off to do their specialty. And after doing that, we could construct a model of the Mid Lake Reef Complex as a seamount. And we see that everything that we talked about has come to pass in this model. So this has been really our goal, not thousands of students, but tens of students at a time who each get a complete rush. So what a team, undergraduates from three different programs in this picture teamed up to collaborate on Lake Character and our water system. Wouldn't you want your workforce team to look like this? Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic presentation, for bringing so many wonderful people into the fold. I think we have time for one very quick question.
or not. Or if there are no questions at this time, then we'll just say thank you so very much and congratulations on this recognition. Thank you.